In the 19, late 1990s, some friends and I started a project called Birthday. And that project was, well, it was a party. It was East Village, New York City, experimental electronic music. And the conceit was each week, Tuesday night, at midnight, we'd light candles. And whoever showed up, we'd celebrate their birthday. So invariably, what we found was each Tuesday night, there would be five strangers in the bar from Thailand or wherever they had come from. And they sat there, shaking hands with each other, patting each other on the back, and meeting around this kind of intimate event, which is kind of a friends and family thing, but talking to strangers. It was this serendipitous encounter, the chance encounter. And I bring this up because one of the things that um, we're seeing now is increasingly we're living in data cities. Cities that are organized around things like sensor networks that tell, tell you traffic patterns and other forms of ubiquitous computing, things that are embedded in an environment. And one of the strongest ways that we're getting data about how we're using a city, if not why we're using a city, is through the things that we have in our pockets, the kind of mobile computing of our mobile phones. So if we look at the numbers, it's something like 97% penetration in North America and Europe, 102 to 182% in Asia, 87% uh, in Africa, 92% Latin America, and it goes on and on in terms of uh, India, uh, Middle East, et cetera, where we see just this incredible eruption and over a short period of time. So what we're seeing is a global change in communication. And we're not just, uh, it's not kind of old school communication. You call someone, OK, I'll meet you. We're mapping in real time outside and now increasingly inside. We're sending images. We're sending, we're doing live uh, voice over IP, Skype, or FaceTime with each other. So we have all of these things that we're doing that's outside of what had been uh, the common practices of communication. We're walking around with little computers. And one of two things are coming out of it where we have some industries that never existed before, mobile services or locative design. I walk into a cafe and my phone tells me, you can get an upgrade with that latte if you like us on Facebook. Uh, I walk into a bar. I get a direct message from the person in the red shirt. I see we both heart kitty cats on our uh, Foursquare profiles. I go into the parking garage. The robotic attendant lets me know, yes, there's parking on level two. My avatar stylist tells me, indeed, that dress makes you look fat. So we have all these services. <laughs> and there are, there are two big problems I see with this. One is we're, we're liking a lot. And what I mean by this is we like the stuff we like. We like the stuff that's being recommended to us. Like, oh, you like this? Well, you might also like this. We like these kind of adjacent liking things. We're not liking at all the things that we don't like. And we don't even know about the things that we might like because they're not part of what we like. And before this goes into two Rumsfeldian, a corridor of the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns, what I'm suggesting is I didn't sign up to live my life as if I were shopping on Amazon. I'm actually happy with some of these efficiencies online. But to have them uh, more and more important to the city in terms of my existence, uh, to, for us to contribute in designing uh, lives that are smooth, no striation, no surprises. We only like what we like, and my coffee's a certain way, the people I meet are a certain way. And that chance operation, the serendipitous opportunity of talking to a stranger, is uh, increasingly cut out of how we move through our cities and live our lives. The other side of this is, I mean, there are great efficiencies that come from sensor networks and the rest of it in terms of power saving, I mean, recycling oil, you, you know fried food, all the rest of it, but not so much the fried food recycling oil, but saving water and these kinds of efficiencies that are smart robots. They're getting smarter, and they're perfect for this. But what they can't do, and what's still our job to do, is make our cities magic. So my other beef is all of our technologies, all of our mobile technologies, they're like this. They're head down. So we literally do not see the city in front of us. We literally do not see the people next to us. We're going to have to ask Bloomberg to put in, in addition to the bike lanes, data lanes. So when you get out of the train, you're going to bump into someone because they immediately have to get on their phone. At least there's a place that they can step to. 
the way I see it, we have an opportunity right now. We've got about a five-year window because there's a lot of technology in hand, but it's not yet established what we'll do with it. The cultures around it and our behaviors, it's still up in the air. And that's a very magic moment, and it won't last forever. And we're at this place where uh, uh, ubiquitous computing and mobile uh, telephony it's a shift in the same way that introducing the internet into our lives was a, a technological platform that helped create in, incredible change in the world. Um, <clears throat> so what we're thinking about, and when I say we, it's, it's the people who brought you birthday. It's Sound Lab Cultural Alchemy, which is an experimental electronic music platform that I started uh, back in the mid-90s with my collaborator, Howard Goldcran, and also um, the people who have participated in parties, events, uh, non-permissional taking over of spaces under bridges and the kind of things that you do when you're in graduate school and <laughs> you want to see something exciting happen. And also uh, research, research around, well, what do people do with media and what's meaningful for us? It's not just the technology, but it's the handshake of what can we do with this that's meaningful for it. So what we're thinking about are, um, three uh, attitudes toward design. So not so much templates, but design positions. And uh, it's turned into a network of people living in cities across the, the world. And we have shared interests, even if some of the solves are, are different in each location. So another idea of platform there is it can be shifted depending on the needs of what is happening in a locale. So those uh, design outlooks are the public, the civic, and the poetic. And in the past year and a half, there has been this just ferocious reoccupation of public space. It's been impossible to miss. And a lot of it has led to really just uh, explosive behaviors and toppling of, of government, all kinds of things such as this. So to at least recognize, I don't know, like for 10 years, we were at home sitting on our computers or something. And now people are outside. They're out on the street. So I think let's recognize it, respect it, and also think about, well, how do we build toward sustainability? If we're not, if it's not always a crisis, if we're not always crisis mapping, what does the public engagement look like toward a sustainable but you know fun, engaged culture? For the civic, we can think about someone like a, a, what Lawrence Lessig describes as open source culture, or we can think about our grandmothers, where you have more tools available to all. That's more the open source side of it, and uh, a free sharing of knowledge. The grandmother side of it is more you should know your neighbor's names. You should invest some time in your neighborhood, and you should help clean up and keep things connected. So if we look at the Heidelberg Project in Detroit, where people are using the facades of their houses to transform neighborhoods that are falling apart, or if we think about something like guerrilla gardening, the reappropriation of kind of civic spaces, or just the, the tremendous need to turn your city into a playground. Um, uh, one of the people who we're working with, it's nonfiction in, in the Netherlands. And what they're doing is they're taking unused spaces in a small city north of Amsterdam. And they're wedding these spaces to uh, cultural creatives, young entrepreneurial companies that may need a space. And just the idea that you can use network technology to map the unused spaces and then do that kind of real-time handshake of, well, now we're moving into it. So the poetic and... Uh, <laughs> That's FAT, um, Free Art Technology uh, Crew. And the uh, Graffiti Research Lab was, was part of how they then became FAT, speaking of, of open source. And we literally are finding new ways to write our stories across cities, this one being the Coliseum. You can see the commentary. And for me personally, I don't want to live in a city that doesn't have secrets, that doesn't have kind of writing on the wall that you have to decode alleyways, passages, that you have to kind of find what the story is, and then you understand something more, either the city you live in or, or the cities that you visit. So that kind of poetic space, the chance encounter, and, and the adventure, frankly. So there are two silos that I think are important to think about here. And the first one is the really kind of techie one of um, AR, augmented reality. And in this image, this is a project from 2009. And uh, if someone went down to Lower Manhattan, all New Yorkers, and frankly, almost anyone in the world will recognize this. And you actually have to do this thing where, where you put your 
phone up to your eye, you've got the app on it, and what you see rising in this empty space are two towers of light. And this very personal moment that can also be shared with the people you're with or people coming at different moments in time, it seemed like, I mean, it's not about a graphical realism, it's about this, this, this feeling of here's a city and here's this heart beating in it. Um, some of the AR things are a little bit more, uh, uh, this is a Star Wars AR flash mob in a, in a, in a public square. <laughs> or um, uh, using uh, AR and other mashes up of mobile technology to tell uh, a story across a city in the sense of an alternate reality game, an ARG. So that I want to put in contrast to uh, the rise of the artisanal. I mean, we've all seen the farmer's markets come to our neighborhood, and many of us are celebrating that. And the artisanal, the handmade, I mean, we have uh, bandit groups of crocheting graffitiists making tea cozies for tanks and for parking meters. <laughs> so you have like the, the ultimate handmade and uh, the fallen fruit group where they're mapping in Los Angeles where you have ripe fruit trees that you can go through the city on, in public property and pick these things. So what I'm seeing is a, a, an X, a cross reality, an X media between uh, the technology and the artisanal that I think is the most productive space in terms of designing here. So this is the data of a town's uh, energy usage literally being uh, marked onto the street. So that data cloud, the more abstract of the data city being brought down to the pavement. So one of the design projects with um, City as Platform, it's a playful thing, is uh, the good neighbor algorithm. So what we're doing is we're taking um, ACE dating site algorithms, and I'm gonna have to talk to Helen about this later, and we're bringing them into neighborhoods where people haven't been talking to each other for 10, 20, 30 years. So multiple, multiple generations of people who see each other, their children go to the same school, but for various reasons, cultural, religious, et cetera, like deep reasons, serious reasons, do not talk to each other. So the experiment is, we have to be able to find like a couple of people who end up crossing party lines and talking because their obsessions, their interests are, lie in this other third space. So it's kind of uh, creating the algorithm around the talking to stranger chance encounter. In general, what we're thinking about is platform, it's a framework for systems, and it's not that abstract. Your game box plays different games, your operating system runs different software. A city, if it's more than just an assembly of buildings next to each other, it's a framework. And we all see all kinds of systems that are running, and we have an opportunity to kind of put on our arms, dig in our heels, and like the mild-mannered Diana Prince, turn into Wonder Woman and activate. And that city's platform, that's an API for the city where all of us are invited to participate. So it's not so much the gold eagle breastplate, it's the activation part that I'm inviting you to join us in thinking about. And whether you join us or you join others or you put together your own daredevil crocheting posse of tea cozy makers, this is our moment to look forward, be brave, get some good luck on our side and imagine and make the cities that we want to live in. And ideally, they won't be head down, they'll be heads up. Thank you.